Our speaker uh, for the for the evening, uh, Fran Hill. This young lady you see sitting right over here, uh, Fran Hill Blobom, Blobom grew up on a family dairy farm near Toma, Wisconsin. She graduated from the University of Denver, the University of Birmingham in England, and Harvard University with degrees in political science. She taught at the University of Texas at Austin. Say, I had a Texas joke when I was going to introduce uh, uh, a Hightower, so don't let me forget. Before I get her up here, I'll try to tell you that one. Her, uh, <laughs> her research has dealt with agricultural policy uh, issues in the United States and abroad and has taken her to Africa and Asia and most areas of this country. She has taken a special interest in the roles of farm women. She has interviewed and worked with hundreds of farm women. During the previous administration, she was a consultant to the United States Department of Agriculture. There she organized the first national survey of farm women and the first national farm women's conference. She has testified before Congress on farm women's issues and given speeches around the country to farm and urban audiences. Her interest in the, the widow's tax and other farm tax questions led Fran to law school, which she will complete this year. She is married to Roger Blobaum, an Iowan who has long been involved with NFO and other farm organizations and with a struggle to preserve the family farm. Now, before I ask Fran to come up here, uh, I I want to tell you this Texas joke uh, that I had saved for Hightower, but since he's not uh, uh, going to be here, it's really too good to pass up. It's a, a, a joke that I've heard uh, Earhart Fankston, uh, who I know you all know very well, I've heard him use it uh, very effectively several times, and it goes something like this. Uh, <clears throat> there was a, a big, tall Texan, about six foot seven, standing at a very crowded bar one evening, and in fact, uh, this bar had standing room uh, about only. And it, it was in Texas. And there was a little short fella that came into the bar, and boy, he was mighty thirsty. And he was trying to wiggle his way up to the bar and just doing everything he could to, to get uh, his way up there. And he was trying to get right in between this great big fella and uh, another fella standing right beside him, both of them Texans. And this big Texan didn't like it, and so he just kind of hit him with the elbow, and he knocked this little fellow just head over heels, and he hit the floor mighty hard. And the uh, little boy, uh, he got up and he brushed himself off a little bit, and he was hurting a little bit, but boy, he was still thirsty, and he still wanted that drink, so he started to come up there, and he says, the old Texan says to him, now, Sonny, he says, we don't need you up here at the bar. He says, the bar is crowded, and he says, uh, uh, you just, just go on and play. Well, the little fellow was still mighty thirsty, so he kept a wiggling up there, and the old boy hit him again with the elbow, and boy, this time the old boy really took a tumble, and, and boy, he was hurting mighty bad, but he got up, dusted himself all off, and he was still awful thirsty, so he got the wiggling up there towards the bar, and he says, now, Sonny, he says, if you don't quit this, he says, I'm going to show you some holes from other parts of the country uh, that, uh, that you've never seen before. And uh, the old boy was still pretty thirsty, so he kept a wiggling up there. And so pretty soon, the old boy gave him a, uh, <coughs> a chop right to uh, uh, the... <coughs> uh, well, he grabbed him by the wrist, I guess, and he gave him a flip. And the old boy just went head over heels about like that three times and hit the floor. And boy, he was really hurting. And the old Texan looked around and he says, Sonny, now just in case you're interested, he says, that was karate from Korea. Well... The old boy was pretty thirsty yet, so he wiggled up there a little bit further. And when he got close, the old Texan, he gave him a, a chop to the throat just like that, and the old boy dropped, and he was almost out. And he says, Sonny, he says, just in case you're interested, he says, that was a little judo from Japan. Well, by this time, the old boy was a hurting, and he couldn't take her any longer. So he wiggled his way back out through the crowd, and he was gone for just a little bit, and pretty soon he come back in the door. And he worked his way up just behind that Texan, and he let this old Texan have a mighty blow right over the head. And I'm telling you, it really hurt that Texan. His old eyes just crossed, and his knees buckled, and he fell to the floor. And this little, uh, this little fellow just crawled right up over the Texan and got up to the bar, ordered his drink, and drank it. And he says, now, Mr. Bartender, he says, when that boy wakes up, he says, just in case he's interested, that was a jack handle from Montgomery Ward. <laughs> so, now, 
Fran is also a fighter, especially for the ladies and farmers in general, and she's going to address you on women in agriculture. Fran? Thank you, Lee. The only respectable way I can actually reply to that story is just flash you a quick hook 'em horn sign from Texas, even though I don't live there anymore, and remind you to watch the Cotton Bowl on January 2nd. I'm predicting a Texas victory. I'm, of course, delighted to be here. If I didn't really want to come, I wouldn't have sat in the, Den in the Des Moines airport for five hours this morning trying to get a standby seat and succeeding. I could have gone home and drank tea and talked to Roger, but I decided I'd rather take the chance and make it out to speak at the NFO. Roger had hoped to be here to see his many NFO friends, but as you, many of you know, he's in the middle of a campaign for Congress and he just couldn't make it. As Lee mentioned, what I'm going to talk about tonight is not really something I've dreamed up by myself. It's the product of interviews with literally hundreds of farm women that I've been conducting since 1976. And I think the spirit of these women's interviews is best summed up by a friend of mine from Wisconsin, a farm woman, who, hearing about this research in its very early stages, said to me, you know, we've never talked about ourselves, but that's only because nobody's ever asked us before and farm women have been talking to each other and about themselves ever since, and I think a lot is changing. Nevertheless, women are still, I think, America's invisible farmers. We talk endlessly about the family farm, but we use farmer as a male noun. Women's contributions to family farms and to farm organizations have been hidden from history by a screen of cultural myths about male gallantry and female delicacy. In common usage, men farm, but women only help. Now you've got the picture, right? Husband and wife milking side by side. He's farming, she's helping. Husband and wife drilling wheat in the same field, each of them an identical tractor. It's literally true that for purposes of many laws and certainly for the status of being a farmer in this country, he's farming and she's just helping. Now it's not going to come to you, news to you as farm and ranch operators, that your wives and your daughters do much more than help. Some wives and daughters are probably home right now running the farm or the ranch, so you can sit here and ponder the future of American agriculture here in Denver. Now, it shouldn't be necessary to have to document women's contributions to agriculture. After all, nobody ever tries to document men's contributions. It's just assumed. But it still seems to be necessary. So finally, in 1979-1980, USDA conducted a national survey of women's roles in their farms, farm organizations, and to some extent their participation in USDA programs. I had the privilege of being the consultant to this project from the beginning. If we had time, I could tell you wonderful stories about the good old boys at USDA who suddenly realized they were going to spend a year or two studying women. I could also tell you stories about guys who made it happen, who were helpful and understanding and who realized that this was important. The results of the survey showed that well over half of the women interviewed regularly did some type of farm work. Most farm women reported that they participated with their husbands in making farm management des decisions and that women were especially involved in financial decision making based no doubt on their role as the nation's farm bookkeepers. Nevertheless, despite this role, women still have a long struggle being identified as farmers. However, they think of themselves as farmers. Probably the most startling result that this survey generated, and one that literally shook the men at USDA, is that 60% of the women interviewed felt they could run the farm without their husbands. 
Now, this is not to say that they wanted to run the farm without their husbands, but they felt if it came to that, the IRS being willing, the state tax people being willing, they could run the farm operation. And 55% of the women identified themselves as a, quote, main operator, close quote, of the farm. Now, that identification didn't mean that their husband wasn't the main operator. They just decided that they were important, too, and they decided to tell USDA about it. Now, women's interest in agriculture, if it has to be documented further, has been clearly shown in their response to extension programs. When, on those rare occasions, it, the extension service realizes that women already know how to cult, sew and cook and keep house and provide programs on farm production and farm management, the response is overwhelming. A fairly typical experience is provided by Professor Clarence Olson of the University of Wisconsin Dairy Science Department. He had the idea of having dairy production seminars for Wisconsin farm women on the very sound idea that a lot of women were out there in those dairy barns. He told me when he first looked for a local extension agent to co-sponsor this event, every one of them told him women were interested in recipes, not in calf production. <coughs> However, he found one extension agent, James Ness, who, as luck would have it, sort of ironies of history, was my brother's vocational agriculture teacher in the Toma, Wisconsin High School before he became the extension agent in La Crosse County. Now, James Ness agreed to co-sponsor this seminar, perhaps because he's the father of two very bright daughters and the husband of a very assertive wife. There was room for 50 women in this seminar. Quickly, all 50 places were taken. Then the inevitable happened. There was a blizzard in Wisconsin. All 50 women showed up at the dairy production seminar in the middle of a Wisconsin blizzard. And I can assure you that the roads in Wisconsin are much hillier and more dangerous than anything I'm seeing now that I live in Iowa. Hog production seminars at the University of Missouri have generated a similar response from farm women. Farm management seminars have been oversubscribed in Iowa. Yet, even with the best of intentions, sometimes these things go somewhat awry. I remember a seminar in Mason City, Iowa. 385 women in attendance and more trying to register, but the hall wouldn't hold anymore. What was the extension service distributing? A pamphlet entitled Father Son Farms. It didn't seem quite the thing for the occasion, but I guess it was all they had. Nevertheless, the attendance at this event certainly proves that women are interested in agriculture. This should hardly be surprising. After all, it's their livelihood and the future of their families. Now, the assumption that men farm but women only help would simply be amusing. After all, women can take a joke. We've taken lots of jokes historically, and one more wouldn't matter a whole hell of a lot. But these assumptions about women's roles have rather serious consequences, both for farm women and for agriculture. I submit to you that farm women cannot afford to remain invisible, and the farm organizations can no longer afford to ignore at least half the available talent in their ranks. The problems of agriculture are too critical for farm organizations and for USDA to continue operating as men's clubs. Women, of course, have been far more visible in the barns and the fields of American farms than they have been in the boardrooms of agricultural organizations. Now, women are certainly interested in joining farm organizations, and about as great a percentage of them as of men are members of farm organizations. However, when we get to leadership, the question is rather different. You know, and I know, and everybody who looked at it knows that none of the national farm organizations have ever advanced more than a handful of women, if that many, to the policy-making level. Agricultural organizations have wanted women to be volunteers and nurturers and generally good guys, but not leaders. It's as though the organizations have created a policy threshold that very few women have been allowed to cross. The explanation for this is somehow that decision-making is men's work. 
This strikes me as more than a little silly. Women simply can't be too delicate to worry about collective bargaining and legislative lobbying. After all, if they're home reasoning with angry Holsteins, driving tractors, and saving calves from the blizzards, they probably can manage to sit in a room for eight to 10 hours and think about the next step in the struggle to save the family farm. During my own research in the Middle West, women told me of many incidents that suggest the relative lack of representation of women in the leadership ranks of farm organizations does not reflect women's preference, but an organizational preference. A Wisconsin farm woman, for instance, thought that she had joined one of the national farm organizations. She had indeed written the check herself. The membership card came back in her husband's name, and she was more than a little discouraged. And then she got mad and straightened it out. In Texas, a woman who had won election as a delegate to the national convention of her farm organization, beating in the process the, na the state vice president, somehow was discouraged from attending as a delegate, and the good old boys delegation sailed off to wherever it was the good old boys were meeting that year. Now, women's attitudes toward this whole state of affairs is hardly one of acquiescence, but they can still take a joke. On a questionnaire that I distributed to farm women in the Middle West, there was a question that said, should a man feel entitled to leave his wife home to do the chores while he attends a farm meeting? Well, almost all the women disagreed with that, but one of them just summed it up nicely. She wrote very neatly across the questionnaire form, ha, 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 exclamation point, et cetera. Now, this same questionnaire showed that women are interested in more visible and responsible roles in their farm organizations. 83% of the women I interviewed with this questionnaire felt that women should play a more active role in farm organizations. And only 10% felt very strongly that women's place is exclusively in the home. Women are ready to take the responsibility that organizational participation requires. Those few women who think it is still possible to sit on a pedestal and send their husband out to protect them from all the dangers of the world probably are going to have to rethink that if the foreclosure movement that seems to be taking shape actually does materialize. Now, Roger tells me that whenever I go out to give a speech on this topic, as I frequently do, I reduce the quality of life for hundreds of farm men. Now, that's not my purpose at all. And actually, Roger had hoped to be here sort of as living proof that one can live with this and still survive in fine shape. However, his comment does really, I think, highlight a common fear, a fear that somehow if women are going to be involved, men will be less involved. Somehow it will diminish man's role. It will take something away from him. This strikes me as certainly not true. There's just too much work to be done in agriculture organizations to argue that increased involvement of men is, or of women is somehow going to take something away from men. I think, frankly, it is unreasonable to expect that men can or should shoulder all the burdens of saving the family farm by themselves. And I think it's self-defeating to try to exclude the women out of the fear that they're not going to be one of the boys. You might be surprised and indeed appalled at the range of jokes a woman knows and might be induced to tell at a farm meeting if you were really nice to her. You might not really want to know what women have cooked up on their own. And I think probably that there's going to be very little social change in the home. Most farm women activists I know, before they go to the meeting, manage to cook enough food for His Excellency, their husband, put it in aluminum foil packages, label it not merely with the contents, but with the day and the meal at which it should be eaten. This hardly seems to me as a blow against American family life. 
One could wonder, of course, about a man who thinks he can run American agriculture but can't cook his own dinner, but that's certainly a private matter. Farm women, I submit, have proved their effectiveness in farm organizations. They have always done the public relations and the product promotion. And for those of you who've never had the joy of going on live TV on the farm hour, knowing that if you blow it, it's going to be in bedrooms or dining rooms or breakfast nooks all over the state with your friends watching, have never really lived. Women do it, and they do it all the time. NFO women organized a successful response to the beef boycott in the 1970s. They stood in front of supermarkets and they engaged in one-on-one -on -one consumer education. Women have, if you'll pardon the pun, manned NFO's collection, dispatch, and delivery system for years, keeping the records at livestock points and grain offices across the country, much as women have kept the books on the farm. Farm women have proved that they have political clout and that they know how to use it at the national level. The effort to abolish the widow's tax illustrates how effectively angry women can assault Congress. As many of you know, this grassroots effort was launched by Doris Royal, a Nebraska livestock producer. Mrs. Royal told me how she had spent a day rescuing calves from a blizzard and with her home filled with the half-frozen newborns, she realized that in the eyes of the law, she hadn't been farming that day. She'd made no contribution whatsoever. So she tried to interest her farm organizations in this, and she got nowhere. So she launched a national petition drive that in a few months collected a quarter million signatures in all 50 states. This was enough to get Congress to hold hearings on the issue. And at the hearings, the farm organizations walked in and testified, not exclusively on behalf of abolition of the widow's tax, but they tried to use women's anger to abolish the entire inheritance tax, in other words, to make it easier for fathers to pass land on to their sons. This created a stalemate that lasted for several years until the women had the sense to say, we're going to do it on our own and we're going to demand no taxation between spouses and we're going to stand up for our own rights. And they did it. Now, the impact of all of this has been felt in Congress. And I know no better way to explain this to you than to tell you about a breakfast meeting with Ben Stong. Roger took me to breakfast one morning with Ben, who characteristically was in his office well before 8 a.m. Ben was then working in Senator Melcher's office. And he was being, he said, inundated by requests for information from farm women. He also reported that more and more rather angry and very articulate farm women were coming to Washington in person to lobby. And since Montana had a very active farm women's movement, they were all coming through Senator Melcher's office. Now, the other good old boys in the Senate noticed this, and so they called up Melcher and asked what was going on and why couldn't they get those women under control and the usual range of questions. And Senator Melcher, knowing he had a good staffer, said to Ben, what's going on? And Ben said he didn't know either, so he thought maybe I would know. And I told him that they were sitting there at their kitchen tables running a grassroots movement, and I didn't think it was going to stop. And finally, Ben asked me the question that every man asks at some point in these proceedings. He literally said to me, what do the women want? Well, of course, by this time, Roger was convulsed in laughter, having asked me that several times himself. And my answer then, as always, is respect, recognition, and remuneration. Women want, in other words, the same thing as men without becoming men. Frankly, guys, we wouldn't become you. We've been saved from that. We don't want everything that you've got. We just want the respect, the recognition, and the remuneration. Now, one reason women have become such effective agricultural lobbyists is that they keep the farm books, and they really know what's happening. And as Phil mentioned, the problem that lights up half the sky is the financial problem, the foreclosure problem. Another reason that women are so effective 
is that they're willing to tell the painful truth. Now, men can't do this, and it's not their fault. Men have always been taught that they must be brave and strong and know all the answers. Even before the questions have been worked out sometimes, they've still got to know all the answers. No, women have always been considered fairly stupid. Maybe decorative, but fairly stupid. This, in politics, is an advantage. As one woman told me, if I go into a congressman's office or I go into a USDA official's or I even talk to somebody in my own ag organization and I make a mistake, I haven't lost any ground. They thought I was stupid when I walked in. How much worse can it get? With a man, there is pride. He has been taught that everything has to be perfect. He's in charge. Well, women can tell the truth, and they will. When a man goes to talk about the problems of agriculture, and we know that at least in much of the Middle West, the problems are so acute that a lot of people may not be farming next year. A man will go and say, Congressman, the situation in agriculture is terrible. I'm doing all right, of course. Women, free of this need to appear all-knowing and all-powerful, will say, the situation in agriculture is terrible, and I have the evidence from my own farm to show you how and why. Women's willingness and ability to tell the truth, even when it's painful, also will help build alliances among farmers. We have in Iowa now the common phenomenon of farmers going out of business and their neighbors not even knowing they were in trouble. These people aren't building alliances and mobilizing to save themselves. They're simply thinking that they should know all the answers, and they're letting pride stand in the way of survival. I submit to you that if more women were in leadership positions in farm organizations, the debt crisis that now threatens to transform American agriculture from a system of dispersed owner-operator family farms to a system with a few owners and a paid labor force could be stopped. Women would share the truth about their own farms with each other and with policymakers. And they would have the courage to suggest perhaps fairly radical solutions, such as the kind of debt rescheduling that has been applied to the Chrysler Corporation and to foreign countries like Brazil. I think the times in agriculture are about as bad as they were in the 1890s. And during that Dust Bowl time, when farm prices had dropped so low that you couldn't afford to market corn and had to burn it in your stoves, a farm woman, mother, and leader of the People's Party Mary Lease urged farmers to raise less corn and more hell. In the 1980s, I submit, it's time for farm women to achieve equality in hell raising on behalf of their families, their farms, their farm organizations, and American agriculture. Thank you.